So if we could, um, I'd just like for you to start with a brief introduction. Um, and then after that, if you'd like to read us a statement or two. I'm Charles Woodruff Coates. Um, I have a undergraduate, a bachelor's of fine arts from Savannah College of Art and Design in uh, sequential art, which is uh, comic book storytelling. And I received uh, a master's of fine arts degree from the University of Arizona um, in 2013 13, uh, for uh, uh, printmaking. And so now uh, I'm living in San Jose, California, and I'm teaching at SFAI. And uh, I'm doing a five-year residency uh, with some other artists in Palo Alto uh, and some artist studios sponsored by the city. Fantastic. So that's, that's, a, that's a very quick and dirty. <laughs> Maybe talk a little bit about what it's how it's been for you, like working, um, like in the residency so far, like what it's like being like mm. a professional artist. Sure. So one thing that I think is uh, like by by far, uh, you know, for me the most beneficial thing is be you know establishing a strong network of artists, and this is something that you know, uh, you get in a university system as a student, you know, you have your friends, you have your colleagues, and as soon as um, you graduate, you all go your separate ways, <laughs> and you realize how important that time in the classroom is. Uh, and so for me, you know, being a part of a network of 21 other working artists is um, is priceless, and it's something you know that I sorely miss after after graduate school. You know how it is; everyone graduates, and then like just breaks off into different directions. But uh, it is, I would say, like one of the most important things. Like the most important thing, aside from making your work, is uh, is relationships, and you know, keeping those relationships strong. You know, because you guys are all taking this printmaking class now. Um, you're going to want to stay in touch, you know, because you're going to, you know, find out later on how crucial those relationships are. Absolutely. So, but it, it's inspiring uh, because you know the the studio that I'm in is like a high school. It's it's a renovated high school, um, and so we're all in a high school classroom. I'm splitting a room with a sculptor uh, who can build anything. And you're talking so, about your studio space, correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'm splitting my, my studio space with a sculptor that you know uh, that founded a museum in, in San Francisco. The guy can build anything, and so it's great to have him as a uh, a per, like a professional connection and a friend. Um, and I'll just be in the studio working one day, and another artist will drop by, and before you know it, like you know, we haven't been working for an hour. We've been talking about something else art related. So. Uh, it's good to maintain like a classroom environment as much as you possibly can. I think that's awesome. Yeah. That's After school, mm. wonderful. And then I also liked what you said just about keeping keeping up with making work. I feel like a lot of students will graduate <laughs> and then they just stop making work. Yeah, it's difficult. It's it, it's and there are two things that I think are important. One, you have to you know you have to love what you do. I th it sounds cheesy, but but it's really true. You have to enjoy the work. You have to find meaningful value in the artwork you create, um, whether you know solely be the process or uh, uh, I would say the um, what your artwork is about or some combination of the two. And you have to have friends to do it with you, right? That's what's one thing that's great about printmaking because if you're you know, by yourself carving wood blocks in the kitchen in the wee hours of the morning, that sounds nice and romantic, but you'll probably be going a little crazy. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's great, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing. You can connect with people who do the same thing that you do. Like these prints demanded a lot of space and it was, you know, it was difficult to work in the garage, it, it sufficed for 
a few of these prints, but I, I quickly found that I needed like a real official space to do work. So it's important to have a setup. Um, you know, and like, like when I say a setup, I think I also mean something like, uh, like a sacred space, something just for artwork. The kitchen is a really great place, but the kitchen is always in your house. You know, it's always looking at you and making you feel guilty when you're not sitting down there working on a wood block. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so it's, it's important to find a community print shop or stay involved with the university somehow. Um, and just have like a, you know, a, a sacred space for doing nothing but art. And, and you know, drinking and, and throwing wine all over your work is a... Yeah. I, I don't advise that. Don't, don't try it at home, kids. <laughs> well, cool. So um, having a devoted space is something really, really important as far as keeping your discipline as an artist. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, for you guys, you have the, the community print shop, which is perfect. Uh, but I would really start looking around so you can find something like that in Jacksonville. And if you can't, start something up yourself. You know, the, um, the internet would make that really easy. <laughs>
and then I'm going to reproduce this image using screen print or woodblock or you know whatever uh, medium of your choosing. But uh, with the cathedral prints, I wanted to leave it a little bit. I want to leave it a little bit more open ended. So um, when I'm applying the Sumi ink to to the paper, it's a very reactive process. Okay, that's a great wow. <laughs> or, or, or would you not bring anything at all? Yeah. Uh, I'm a minimalist. I don't need anything. But no. Uh, let me think. What would I bring with me? Um, I would bring. Uh, geez. Uh, so uh, this question is so broad and abstract. I would say in an <laughs> art context, right? No, it's great. I love questions like this. And in an art context, I would bring. Um, let's see, uh, the, an iPad, assuming that the, uh, the, the, electricity, I, yes. that the island had Wi-Fi. Does this island have Wi-Fi? Uh, yes. Some of them do. Like, it's like tropical trees, but some of them are actually, uh, AT&T towers, you know? Uh, so I would bring an iPad with Wi-Fi, uh, because, uh, the iPad for me in the, in the past has become uh, a really wonderful sketching tool. And when I, uh, I spend a lot of time drawing in uh, like social spaces like bars and restaurants and things like that. And you know, the, you know, the iPad became, uh, you know, the iPad, uh, just so many incredible drawing apps on it. And I use it as a way to experiment with color and uh, draw people really fast. And if someone notices, I can just kind of flip out into, you know, like the internet screen or something. But uh, um, the I, you know, it, it, like the iPad is becoming essential to a lot of steps in my work, whether it's just drawing people in public or figuring out flats for my next print, um, and as a communications device uh, because I can use it to uh, you know tweet out and Instagram out the the work I'm doing. Um, if like there's you know, if I'm alone on an island, again, I don't want to go crazy, so I have to find someone out there in the internet, the world of the internet, to communicate, you know, artwork about. Um, so I would definitely bring one of those. Uh, I would bring, jeez, uh, I guess I could, I would say I would bring my favorite movies, but I can stream movies on the iPad too. <laughs> Uh, and then you know I would bring uh, I would bring an axe to cut down some trees so I can make some wood to carve some wood blocks, um, and then uh, I would bring an endless supply of paper to print with. <laughs> but the but the uh, but the the iPad I think would be everything. Um, I'd bring uh, uh, a you know some paper copies of my favorite books uh, because I love reading. So I'd probably bring a cup you know a copy of uh, Tale of Two Cities with me. Okay. Uh, yep. Ah, okay. So, yes, I remember this question. Uh, I'll just elaborate a little bit on on it. So, um, one one of the ways I got to that that method, and one reason why it works for me is uh, my artwork. I, I'm a terrible editor. I'm getting like visual editor. I'm getting better at it. But when I when I you know, create my prints, um, there's like so much information in there, and it's difficult for me to figure out what to leave in and what to leave out. And so um, that like there's there's a, a another video on my website, I think called like pulling white noise, or it's it's this giant like four by eight foot wood block I did, and it's like you know, in this bar and like people are, everyone's on their cell phones making out or something. Uh, but it, it's like, it's an incredible busy print and it's so hard for my eye to, like for anyone's eye, I think, like to settle on something. And so when I started doing the cathedrals um, and printing in white, uh, the, you know, it, it became very easy for me to say, okay, all this information is there but it can just sit in the background and the information doesn't have to compete. You know, I can, I can just choose this print, I'm gonna highlight, you know, the, like these few areas. Uh, and then the next print, I'm gonna focus on something like this, you know, this tree. 
Um, and so it's kind of like, you know, I'm printing the entire story in one print, the entire narrative, but, uh, you know, within each separate print, I'm kind of like maybe, you know, telling a little bit of a different story, right? The, the, uh, the narrative unfolds in, in a slightly different way, depending on the print. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So all the information is there and all the work, but I'm I'm only choosing to reveal a little bit here and there. And you know, the Cathedral series for me right now is a very young series. I'm still very much it's definitely a series in flux. Um, now that I'm I'm actually printing with water-based inks, they're gonna become like you know, I'm working on more layers. And so, you know, for me this this series is is evolving a great a great deal. So, awesome. but but stories are through line, you know, in all of them. Do what? what was... I didn't oh, 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 but the, the but the I you know I envisioned them to be each one is telling a little bit, you know, the same story but in a little bit of a different way. Yeah, sure. So I like to talk a little bit about you know uh, about that. Um, so how did uh, how did I start using the Sumi ink? So after uh, uh, when I started doing the series, I was pulling uh, the prints, um, you know, basically with the white on white method because I was using uh, this Japanese paper, which is fairly new to me, and. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, you know, for me, like ideas on a grand scale, you know, uh, and I was working with imagery that kind of, you know, demands to be seen on a on a grand scale too, like these, you know, imaginary landscapes with these imaginary, you know, gothic structures in them, and uh, I was printing in white on white, you know, the white ink on the paper because I really loved the silvery effect. You know, like the white ink really highlights like the silvery nature of the paper, um, but they did feel incomplete. And while I was doing my graduate studies, uh, one of the professors at the U of A, Sheila Pitt, um, said, "You know, these are great, but you know, they really need something else. You should try putting Sumi ink on them." And uh, it was a great, it was a great suggestion. Uh, you know, because sometimes, you know, as a printmaker, like like for me especially, I tend to be very uptight and uh, controlling. <laughs> like the like the prints are tightly registered, and I measure out the paper exactly. Um, but the uh, you know, and so after I pull the print, working on top of it with the Sumi ink, uh, one thing that I found is that it makes it makes it the work less precious. And I know that sounds a funny thing to say, you know, that I want my work to be less precious, but um, I like the idea of uh, not sticking to something, like not, you know, not printing a work and, and just holding it up and saying, this is it, you know, like babying it, protecting it. Uh, I'm not going to touch it anymore, you know. I, You know, for me, the Sumi Ink is a... You know, it, it's a random chaotic element. Um, you know that conflicts with uh, a very what is a very tight image, and so I like that. I like that conflict within the work. Be, you know, because everything else about the work is so calculated. You know, the semi ink disrupts that and and adds a brand new layer onto it. So, um, and so after I pull the print, I. Sometimes I'll let the ink dry and it'll look different. The white ink, that is. I'll let the print dry and then work on, work on it the next day with the Sumi ink. Or sometimes I'll pull the print and just start working, you know, directly on top of the Sumi ink right then and there. I'll pin it up on my wall and start working on it immediately. And it's a very different effect because the oil and the, and the white ink and the Water and Sumi ink is all like mixing and becoming grimy and nasty and nasty equals good in art language. <laughs> nasty. Good. Nasty. Make it nasty.
That's a great question. Um, you know, why does this series have to be woodcut, right? Why can't it be litho? Why can't it be etching? Um, so when I'm working out an idea for, or I remember your question. I had a written response to it, but uh, I'll, I'll just ignore that. Um, so when I'm when I'm working when I'm working out an idea uh, in my head, I kind of think, what's the best medium, you know, to you know, to communicate, you know, what I'm thinking, what I want to get across to the viewer. And so I just kind of write a bullet list out. I want the prints to be large. You know, I want them to be immersive. I want, I, I, you know, I want them to connect with people. Um, I want people to walk up and look at them closely and, you know, be able to get close to them um, and kind of be immersed in the work. Um, and so... You know, for me, very few printmaking, you know, processes can do that. Woodcut's one of the mediums with which you can work very large. And so, you guys know, you did the steam rolling. Did you guys do the steam rolling? No, some, some, some of the or, students in here have, but some of them haven't done it yet. Okay. I, I okay. helped out, but so, I haven't so one, printed. Yeah, so one advantage of woodblock is that you can work very large, you can tile it, um, and the the... You conceptually, uh, I wanted the, the artwork to be a, a very transitory and ephemeral. So, you know, when you print on Western paper, like Reeves BFK or something like that, you can pretty much see the entire image. But with this uh, Japanese paper I'm printing on, uh, depending on the angle which you approach the image, it, it you know, it shifts. You know, the... Um, when you look at my work, it's kind of difficult to see the entire picture because you might step to the side and the light will shine through the paper a different way, um, right? And, and I can't use that paper necessarily with etching or relief. I, I could, but it wouldn't look the same. And so the idea was to create these structures that are somewhere between reality and in your mind. <laughs> And I want them to feel very ghostly, you know, and transparent. And so to achieve that feeling, I said, well, I should really use this Japanese paper. And it also works because with this paper, I can print very large by hand. So, uh, you, know, you know, to answer your question, I'm, uh, when, I, when I have an idea for a series, I just kind of bullet point out what's important to me to get across and how I can best do that and hopefully everything falls into place. Um, and so, you know, working big on the Japanese paper, I'm able to, you know, get that immersive feeling um, that I want the viewer to have and also get that effect of, you know, structures being neither here nor, nor there, you know. Um, like, how to create the surreal landscape. Yeah, so this is tough. Um, I think it's great, like, if you're, when you're an artist, I think it's great to work on different types of, of work at once. Like, you have a body of work over here, then you have another body of work over there. And I'm not saying that everything you, has, you have to do or that everything that I do like fits nice and tidy into a separate compartment with its own theme, you know, with a bow on top. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're working on different series at the same time, they tend to influence one another, which is exciting because like new ideas, you know, are born. And uh, I, I think if you just continue to like, or if I just continue to work on things every single day, um, uh, and, you know, over the span of a few years, you start to see these, these uh, similar themes, like, slowly, like, you know, emerge that have been simmering, you know, in the back burner of your subconscious for years, um, or my subconscious for years. And so, you know, I, I think when I, if you were to look at some of my work, I, I have a lot of drawing that I do on a daily basis. That's you know people in bars and restaurants and you know other social spaces that are completely unaware that I'm drawing them, you know, and that 
you know, that piece, you know, you know, that that whole body of work, you know, is I guess about um it can be about people who seek solace in social spaces, who have a desire to be out in public but can't tear themselves away from their um personal devices to talk with the people that are you know, in the space with them, in their immediate physical space. Um, a lot of it's about uh, private conversations and assumptions. And a lot of it is about me kind of, you, you know, looking at these people and drawing them. And some, a lot, a lot of people accuse me of being a voyeur. That's fine. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, they become very autobiographical pieces because, in a sense, I'm doing the exact same thing that that they're doing. And this is something I didn't even realize until I was, like, in graduate school. And so, you know, you have that body of work which is completely separate, and then you look at something, you know, like the Cathedral Suite, um, which couldn't be more different, right? But then there's similar themes there you know, when it comes to, like, solace or, or loneliness, um, you can find hints of that, you know, throughout the work. Uh, and so, you know, some, you know, some pieces of work might have a very strong emphasis on, um, on uh, one particular thing, and then another piece might have, you know, another strong emphasis on another thing in my work, but with a subtext. Um, you know, from that might be stronger and, and another thing. But I think one through line, if you look through, you know, all the series I have, is that I, you know, I guess I can go back to the umbrella artist statement. Like, one of the first questions was, is there an artist statement, you know, that just encompasses all of, all of the work I do? Um, if I, I think if I were to answer that question now, <laughs> like 40 minutes later, uh, you know, I, you know the, the through line in all of my series is that I look to the past to understand present situations. So I'm always drawing from antiquity, you know, the, the Gothic cathedrals. Um, in my video work, I have youth posing as Hellenistic Greek sculptures. Uh, the, the drawings I do in bars and restaurants are very reminiscent of artists working during the 19th century in cafe culture like Whistler and Toulouse Trek. Um, and so like the, the floating Acropolis piece is drawn from Greek architecture, but all these things are about current current social situations. So so that would be the major theme across all bodies of work. And it's not yeah, and it's not something I realized until, you know, years later. You know, years later. So, okay. And now, does your um, your history with sequential art ever uh, influence? Oh, any? Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I just I'm, I was personally interested in it because I sure. I do a lot of work in sequential art. I was when you said that I was like, oh wow. Um, so yeah. I didn't know if that's still a major influence. Mm -hmm. Um, it just pops up all the time. Who was that other person who had the question? Maybe you can add, like ask it together. Uh, sure. <laughs> this is a bunch of more questions. Chrissy's little ca know. she's a little camera shy, yeah. so. All right, you can ask it. You can ask it in her in her honor or in her okay. you know for her. Okay. So what's the, what's the yeah. question? Chrissy's question is: Does your sequential um, art ever? Mm -hmm. Influence your your current um, works. Yeah, absolutely. All the all the time, and I don't even like. I sometimes I realize it. Sometimes I look back. And I'm just like, holy crap, there it is again. Uh, and no, that was a major thing because um, sequential art has, um, you know, a rich history in printmaking. Um, if you look at uh, the Prince of Hogarth, right? He did, uh, everyone should look up Hogarth's uh, prints, like a rake's progress. It's this whole series of prints he did of, uh, what was it? No, Harlot's process, progress, of a, of a street harlot, a, a prostitute in London, you know, striking it rich with an older client. And then the whole, you know, of course they spend money and then become poor again. But that's a, that's a story told across 
like 20 panels, 20 different prints, uh, told in a sequential process. So when you would view this work, I saw this work in Savannah and it highly influenced me because you would start, you know, you would start, look at one print um, on the wall and as an image, it's complete, it's singular and it's, it's funny to look at, it's satirical and on, you know, judging the, the picture, the engraving by itself, it's like a singular complete piece. But then you walk to the right and the piece next to it is the next progression of the story. And that, that, by, that piece by itself is also complete and beautiful, but part of a, you know, the whole series acts as one straight narrative. And that blew me away. And when I started looking at um, the history of like other printmakers, for example, uh, if any of you guys read uh, manga, like Japanese, you know, Japanese comic books. We got a few here, yeah. yeah. So manga is a direct, you know, result of Japanese woodblock printmaking. If you like manga, then you really need to start looking at old Japanese prints because they're dealing with the same folklore, the same characters, and it's a brand new way, you know, of, of telling um, the same cultural, you know, narratives. Uh, it's funny, I was in uh, Japan earlier last year doing a residency, and everyone in Japan reads manga. Like, everybody. And it's so funny for us, because we're, like, I would be on the bus and see some old dude reading manga, um, and just like, look at that guy, and, and like, men and women reading this stuff. And it's, it, but it's because it's so richly attached to their history, which was Japanese football printmaking. So, um, so the two are inseparable. Uh, if you look at the Prince of Damie, you know, another satirist, again, sequential. Um, in, my, in my own work, um, I, would, I would see the cathedral suite as, you know, beginning to tell a sequential, you know, type of story. Um, because if you like to draw comics and if you like to read comics, don't forget that that's all concept, right? It's all a story with themes in it that's being told through images. Um, so, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, the, yeah, it, it, whenever I'm creating a piece of artwork that my history and sequential art pops up, you know, all the time. <laughs> Oh boy. So, oh gosh, we could be here all day. So in the realm of visual art, there, there are a few. Um, Toulouse-Lautrec and Whistler are the two big wigs because it was them that really, that really pushed me straight into printmaking territory. In fact, um, I was drawing a lot and, and, you know, drawing a lot in public. Um, before printmaking, you know, because doing sequential art, my first degree, they encourage that to go out and draw people in everyday situations. And when I went, and I really loved the drawings, but when I saw my first exhibition in Atlanta, like it just blew my mind all over the all over the wall. I had to pay for everything. Um, but 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 seeing Whistler's work. Uh, uh, you know, me directly into printmaking territory. And when I started looking at other artists during the time, um, like, like Toulouse the Trek, I said, wow, this guy is doing the same thing that I'm doing, but he was doing it way back then. You know, I would start to look at his paintings and I would say, you know, what did, what influenced Toulouse the Trek? Well, Japanese prints did. You know, if you look at if you look at his work, they're flat and graphic, and they have these narratives, um, but they're also beautiful paintings. And you know, Lautrec was also very interested in animation too, which I have a long time interest in. Um, so I started looking at some of that. But uh, and so those are the two big wigs. I'm always looking at their work. More contemporary artists: um, uh, Anselm Kiefer is a ginormous inspiration. And if you guys don't know who Anselm Kiefer is, you need to look him up. Uh, he's an incredible painter, and uh, his work is worth traveling to.
Like if there's an Anselm Kiefer exhibition like seven hours from where you are, it's worth it to get in the car and travel to see that, that work. No joke. Um, Richard Evencorn is, is, a, is a big inspiration uh, because his compositions are so tight. Uh, like Richard Diebenkorn is a master uh, of composition. Um, he's, he's one that I'd highly recommend looking at. Goya for his satire and his nightmarish work. Like, you know, we, you know, today we can make extremely gory and graphic uh, depictions of war, but nothing will be more graphic than his, you know, disasters of war etchings that are so nightmarish. You just can't get worse than those. Um, you know, film and, and writing, uh, I, like David Fincher is a filmmaker that just makes beautiful compositions. You know, he's the one who did Fight Club, Gone Girl, Zodiac, The Social Network. When I, when I look at his films, you know, I'm just like, wow, his images are so striking. You know, he can tell a story with image alone. Um, yeah, so those are, those are a couple of my favorites. Um, you know, Charles Dickens is an incredible writer. I think I mentioned him earlier, Tell Two Cities. He's someone who influenced me a great deal. Uh, uh, yeah. I, oof, boy, that, that's just opening a huge can of worms. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think... This really, uh, this book came out, I think it's relatively new, and it's called Show Your Work. It's for artists. It's a little square book about this book. You all should pick up a copy. It's like nine bucks, and it talks about showing your work online, um, or, or just l like artists, you know, how to show your work, and why, why it's important nowadays to do that. Um, and it doesn't go into great detail. It's a very broad book. But one of the interesting things about that is that it talks about, the book talks about sharing a little bit each day. And what that does is it does build, you know, a, uh, a legacy, so to speak, or overarching, an overarching story that you can't see yet, you know, but if you're creating artwork and posting it every single day and you step back from it, you think, holy, you know, holy shit, this is what my work is about. You know, but you can't see it when you're up close, beveling the edge of a zinc plate. You know, you can't really see what it's all about. But if you just record a little bit every day, you know, the the picture, the your whole life's work up to, to this point comes into focus. And so, social media is incredible for that. And one of the fun fun things for me has been figuring out how to curate different social media platforms to tell a different story or, or, or to introduce a different way of looking into my work. And so for me, you know, over the course of using social media, I began to curate my feeds. So, what, you, know, you know, what's great about Instagram? You know, why is Instagram different than Flickr? Why is it different than Twitter? Why should I care? Well, for me, one thing that's interesting about Instagram is that people use it to show what they're doing right now. Like you look at someone's Instagram feed and you're like, oh, that's what this person's doing right now. You know, because the idea is like you take a picture, it's small, it's on an iPhone, or is Instagram on Android? I don't know, but uh, probably. But you take, you take a picture because you're there right now and you want to share that moment. And so for me... Instagram became a great way to, to, to show the process of me drawing in bars and restaurants or somewhere else, right? And if you look at my feed, I've, I've kind of created this thing where I hold up my sketchbook to show what I've been drawing or, you know, and so the background is there and then the, then the drawing is there. And that's just something I invented because of the medium. Like, I didn't think to really do something like that before Instagram, but thinking about what Instagram is about, I was like, wow, it'd be really cool if my entire Instagram feed is just me drawing unwilling, you know, unknowing victims <laughs> in these spaces because they're too preoccupied. Um, and so, you know, that would be very different than something like a Pinterest page, you know, like 
my work's already on my website. Do I just want to like throw it up on Pinterest too? No, you know, but Pinterest is a great way to gather images. So I use, I'm starting to use like Pinterest more as a way to catalog things that inspire me, you know, visual images that inspire me or things that um, I want to use as reference. So it's, it's a lot of fun to look at all these. Yeah, you guys are in a great spot. You know, we didn't have this stuff 10 years ago. I didn't like, you know, it didn't even like, like 10, 15 years ago, it didn't even really exist or it was very much in its infancy. And so there's all these exciting new platforms that you can use to get your work out into public. You know, and I highly recommend you do that and figure out, you know, what the, you know, what each platform has to offer you. You know, there are a lot of artists right now that work solely in Instagram um, doing highly curated feeds. So yeah. embrace, embrace that. Embrace those different platforms and figure out how they can work for you as an artist. You know, whether it's photography, using the iPhone or Android thing as a, uh, you know, a photograph device or, um, or as a way to show your work or your process, you know. Awesome. Yeah, I think that answered your question. Is there anything else that you'd like to close with, or? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I think I might just want to rattle off a couple of books for your students. Sure, that would you be know, great. So, so, you know, one one book I think I mentioned earlier was Art. Um, no, no, was it Show Your Work? Mm -hmm. A great book you can read in an afternoon or or a weekend. Um, that you know that talks about getting your work out there. Uh, it's broad, but it's packed full of information, um, and that's written for like today, like it came out a few years ago. Um, Art and Fear is a fantastic read for artists, um, and Stephen King's On Writing is is another. It, 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 I think an essential read for for artists and um, uh, you don't have to be a writer, but the things that Stephen King talks about in, on writing just like really hit home. So those are those are three texts I'd highly recommend. Um, also, also the Goldfinch by Donna Tart. If any like you guys should really read or listen to the Goldfinch. Um, it's a work of fiction that won the Pulitzer Prize last year. And it's a, it's a, like the book is a, a beautiful meditation on, on the power of art. It's a work of fiction, but it's a, the whole book is about the power of art on the viewer. So, Wonderful. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, yeah. That was amazing. And we really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much.